device. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the iPod Touch and the iPhone, which I'm sure everybody's <coughs> seen on the advertisements. Picture quality is pretty good. And again, I'm playing this off of my iPod. What's that? Oh. <laughs> uh, so I'm actually going to try to do this whole thing from here if I can. There's been a lot of talk. How is the iPod connected in through the projector? Actually, this was connected via a regular television cable oh. with a wire. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the iPhone. And let me just stop this thing. Hold on a second. Back a step. Um, the iPhone and iPod touches in around the classroom. <clears throat> there are, the way to break this down with this new device, which I don't think everybody's had their hands on, is um, through applications. And I got tired of typing uh, iPod, I, iPhone and iTouch, so I used the word iApps. And there's basically three big groups you can put down. And what, the first one we should look at are global or institutional applications. What these are are ones that are made by a pretty lar large organization. Um, you, there's clicker style software available for the uh, iPod touch and phone. Uh, communication, which could be used as something as, as easily as an as a, uh, emergency broadcasting system in the case of uh, catastrophe around the campus file sharing between users, and uh, account management. And where this really comes from, and the, the, the biggest people so far to do this has been Texas Christian University. Oh, I should go back up a step. <coughs> Abilene Christian University, excuse me, <coughs> who just this year required every freshman to have an iPhone or an iPod touch. Um, what they've done in this case is the university itself started nine months ago and put together a web-based application that the iPod Touch and the iPhone can use. And students are actually, as you can see, I'll need to read the quote for you, uh, have almost complete access to a lot of their fundamental systems. Now, I don't know if that's going to be happening. And so as widespread as that here at Dartmouth, um, Apple did just release, uh, it's free now, the, the developer program. It's free for universities. So I'm certain we're going to see something come down the road in, in a little while. But even though this part of it is free, this still does require programming time and staff hours. So that's going to be a limiting factor. Um, Mary Flanagan, who's the new chair of the Digital Humanities, I know is very interested in moving down this road. And I think we may see other collaboration with computing services in her office in, uh, going forward with that. In the meantime, um, if you have questions or if you're interested, you might want to check out the video they have, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I can send you that link, or you can just Google uh, iPod University, and you'll, I think it comes up almost right away. <clears throat> the next level of applications are the local ones. And these are ones that are downloadable. Some of them free, and some of them cost money. <clears throat> There's a variety of tools that are here um, which are appropriate for certain levels of education. To be fair, a lot of the ones we can download right away are more K through 12 oriented. Um, the ones that sort of caught my eye were ones that were a little bit more usable from a, fact, from a, a college student's standpoint. Um, free graphing calculator, which might be kind of useful. Uh, flashcards, which can be useful across any, any discipline. Uh, the book Z Free I actually have on mine. It lets you scroll through and read certain books. Not complete, not necessarily appropriate for your class per se, but there are some potential here. And especially with people, you know, every kid, a lot of the freshmen now have one, it's, but it's still not required um, or requested. The CRAM is very interesting because you can do tests that you can create yourself and then push down to students. Um, the drawbacks to these are, of course, uh, that you, students have to have an iPod. You probably have to have an iPod or a phone. Um, and like anything else that's a digital orientation, you're going to have to create some of the content yourself, which is going to take a fair amount of time and energy, which, as we've just heard, you know, may not be a negative, per se. But it's something you should factor into your curriculum if you're going to be spending X amount of time uh, creating things for these. Besides Arabic, which I'm glad I have here because Mustafa's here, but there is a, every language you can think of is on there. Um, for Japanese, and uh, there's great kanji flip pages. And because it's an iPod, there actually is a verbal quote, uh, audible quotient as well. I don't have any of those installed because some of those uh, cost a little bit of money. However, there's a lot you can do with the basic applications that come 
on the uh, device itself. Um, iPhoto, which is actually what I'm showing this PowerPoint presentation through right now. Uh, iTunes, of course. Uh, we have full Safari capability if we have web access. Uh, mail, which, and the nice thing about Mail, which people may not realize, is you can read Word documents inside of it. So you can actually email yourself a Word document and look at it and go that way. Um, and a notes feature, which lets you dynamically add note information on top. So the best part about these is they're free. And I'm going to try to show you. Well, they come with the device, I should say. So the question is for students. I mean, are you really going to want to include, make this part of your curriculum, or is this just a really good supplementary tool? And I think that's where currently, without an institution-based um, orientation, I think we need to really consider it as a, as a side reference tool, at least for the moment. Hopefully, that'll change down the road. Let me just get the other thing I see here. If you guys have never used one, the interface is very intuitive. If you've ever had a chance to touch one of these things. But that's something that, that Tom's group can help you with. And we can, let's say in your class, you said, I want to do an experiment where I make my content available both in Blackboard and for the people who have iPhones for them so they can do it portably. You want to do this experiment. All you have to do is come up with this idea and come to us, Tom, or us, and we work with you to see if that's actually possible and do that next step. So you don't need to know the technology. You just have to have the now, inspiration. What, so, maybe, how, if the, this is more than just allowing them to access the web from their iPhone. Correct, which is actually what we should talk about because a lot of faculty don't like them having laptops in their classrooms to begin with because they get distracted from, from the class and instruction. You know, this could easily do the same thing. I have full email access on this. I have full web access. I can actually look at my Blackboard on this device. So. While it has some great power, you've got to sort of take that consideration with, with your teaching style and maybe what will be happening in your, in your class. Um, going back to the basic apps, this is like a, a cheat sheet. So I didn't use anything really fancy. This is just a cut and paste picture of the Mona Lisa um, you know, with information that I've pasted in, which has about the actual artwork itself. Um, Grant, I work with the humanities, so I'm a little humanities oriented. But for the science pe the people in the room, you can do the same thing in biology, where you can have a picture like this of a, of a plant when people go out in the field. Uh, you don't need wireless access. This is just simply iPhoto, or if you are a Windows user, you can put it in your, uh, in your My Photos section, and it'll sync up. You can send it to them. They can put it in. iTunes is free. All this stuff is, is not a big deal, but you have to produce the content. And I'm thinking, wow, this would be great for anybody who's a scientist who's out in the field, where they could have a quick, high-definition picture. And you can actually, exp you can't see it here, but I can expand. I can zoom in. I can take a look at things a little bit closer. Flick back over, over and I can put notes that I may have on the device itself. So there's a lot of flexibility and usability just in the basic device as it is. Um, of course, the videos is another nice thing, as we've seen with that one. But you can also do you know, full-length movies. Just a little play. Let's get forward a little bit. So you, so you can provide a student with a wide variety of media they can actually review on their own time and without being tied to any large physical device, which is kind of, kind of nice. Um, from a faculty point of view, when you, got, when you are traveling, we would really love these as a backup presentation device. Ideally, my PowerPoint would be on my laptop. But if my laptop fails or they don't have the right equipment, all I need is a patch cable and I'm into a, into a television. And you can still present your, uh, your presentation <laughs> and still look good in front of an audience when things don't work out quite right. Fantastic if you're going overseas where you're not really sure what you're going to have on the receiving end. Even throughout Africa and other countries, you, you can still find a television for the most part. And these push to a PAL or NTSC signal. Um, it's nice having that backup, if, if, you, if you know what I mean, across the board. You can also, if you wanted to show movies in class, you can do it this way. The jumping is, is uh, as you saw, is pretty easy to jump around. Um, there are copyright issues, of course, involved if you're recording movies. However, that's changing newer videos, such as I think Iron Man, when it came out in Blu-ray, comes out now with an iPod file. So if you buy the right set, you actually have the right to show it like this, I think. I'm not really sure. But that's something the library can assist with if we talk about copyright, copyright uses. 
The big limitation right now that we're having is trying to stream to them uh, from video. Um, not having a lot of luck with that off of our servers, but we're still playing with that format a little bit. We're having problems with it. Even. Well, the issue is they don't run Flash. <laughs> and uh, that's, that a that's, kind of a, that's kind of a problem. So actually, the, the YouTube conversion on here is they do something funky to get it to play on the, on the iPod Touch or the iPhone. So with any luck, um, down the road in a little bit, we should have um, some institutional movement towards this, I think, because uh, these really are a great, great device. Um, How much do they go for? I'm sorry? How much do they go for? Uh, it started around 250 I think. And for those who might take it in the field, battery time is all, something you may want to consider. Uh, wireless, you're looking at about three hours. Just playing music, 24 hours. Um, just with the screen on and no wireless, you may get nine hours out of it. So if you're going camping for a long weekend, it might be a problem if you're using it actively for a lot of research. Um, but they do make solar powered chargers and things like that you can pick up relatively inexpensive, like below $35 if you look online at the right places. Um, that's a good question. No, I, well, it had to, to be that widespread. But well, I guess what I mean, by like like uh, ACU did with theirs, if we a way with people, could, if we had a portal, a web portal, and uh, students could access Blackboard and Banner that way through them, they might become you know that kind of direction, some kind of support. And you can do the same thing yourself if you design your your own pages to be uh, friendly, which means you know, maybe not as complicated as it might be normally. Making sure you use straightforward uh, file file formats. Um, so in my case, it's, it's hard to institutional support in the sense that I don't know if their decisions have to be made as large as web, uh, Mac versus PC, but the support I got to do some of the things that I'm doing where, you know, it's like, uh, how do you get it to YouTube? What's the easiest way to get in and out of Blackboard, getting it loaded up, so that it's part of my curriculum easily. Um, making sure that it's not, that every professor doesn't have to learn by themselves and that you start to be handed certain things like, this is a list of equipment you need, and I think some of the folks, as they're learning, can tell. But I think the institutional support is to make it really easy for folks who don't want to spend an enormous amount of time learning a software or learning hardware. Well, and maybe direction. I mean, maybe the next version of Blackboard there might be an iPod plugin or something that would be tied. I mean, who knows? Be tied in, and that's where the organization well that. needs to be. Well, yeah. you know what I mean. But needs yeah. to be provided, you know, direction provided that way. Um, but now that you can do the apps for free, at least licensing for free through the university system, it's kind of a nice thing. If you are interested in looking at apps, even if you don't have one, you can go to the App Store in iTunes, um, which again is a uh, bilingual product, so it works on Mac or Windows. Um, and if you search whatever you're looking for, you'll find when they do categories down here, as I did, that the education section is, um, is really aimed at a younger crowd. Um, I would have loved it when I was working with K, K through 12 kids, and, but I, they're not really that great for most college students. You will see that things are added constantly, so you should check on a frequent basis. I think you're going to see, see a continual. Um, this is actually really nice. I actually looked at it. Uh, yeah, on iTunes, for example, there like well, my, there's an amazing amount of stuff on iTunes University is it, that is just incredible that is available uh, for. To adding two courses and linking um, lectures at Harvard, Stanford, and things like that. Do you know the screenshot is I find if I ask around about apps, you know that sometimes they aren't really they're not good for you know curriculum, but they sure are fun. Like I just downloaded Lightsaber, which is really kind of fun. But then there's also the 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 Quran, and it'll read out sections of the Quran. And I'll have it in Arabic as well as English. I just think that's amazing. Yeah. And also, like, um, they had prayers in Hebrew, and um, someone else had an app that would help you learn music and the different chords. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. it's a, there. There. Are, so I always ask, you know, what's your what, what application are you yeah. are you checking out? Because a lot of people do play around. It's, it's there's so many to swim through that can save you a little And that's why I think the students can turn around and tell me what's worth it. They, they you know, letting, I let them know I'm trolling, but I, you know, but what I'm trying to do is make sure that the other professors can get it, and that it's useful for other students. And so I see them almost like the academic computing, where they start to provide for me the subset of things they think I'd be interested in, because I don't want to learn everything. I want to know, I want to learn the ones that look like they'll be good for me. There's a seismometer application because there's an accelerometer built in. 
and in engineering, um, we have an introduction to engineering course, and in the introduction to the course, we do a little lab, which is really an introduction to facilities and people, where the students go around and they make various parts to <clears throat> a little line crawling car. So they will actually um, injection mold a part here and thermoform a part there, and then we put it all together, and we mounted the seismometer on it and measured the vibration as it went along. No, so I, we just, I, have, I just took my iPod and mounted it right on there. Yeah, another toy is I have a level because I do a fair amount of carpentry. So, <laughs> so you can check out Mr. Bubble how things check out. You know, so it's a lot of little stupid things, but you know, fun is good when it comes to education. Yeah. Where I think, at least in, the, where I think in the, in the near future, where it's be most advantageous for this is really if if you can provide some supplementary content for your students, they can take when they're out and doing things. The flashcards, um, like I showed you the picture of the Mona Lisa. You know, my thought as well, if if you're running an FSP program and you're in Paris and maybe you can do some prep work in advance and, and they can, when they're walking through the Louvre, they could actually have some background information that you provided tied to the photograph and look for things that way. Um, with the hard, uh, the hard sciences, same thing. If you're out in the field, you can be able to you know, see geographical structures and be able to have a picture. Well, that's, really, that's kind, of, kind of what it looks like. You know, it's, there's some real potential there. It's just going to be the, the content creation. So just something to think about with this kind of tool is like we're used to thinking of our students acting like we do. So like if I got an article, I would get, I'd sit down and I'd read it and I'd go through and I'd make the time. Our students now are all over the place. They're doing a lot of things. So if you can provide students the content in different ways to fit their lives. So the, the iTouch iPhone has a PDF reader, right, this application. The students have the option, the ability to download the articles on their little thing. And when they're out and about, when they, go, they can grab it, they'll read it in quick chunks, or read it and do something else. You're not doing anything else. You're still teaching the material. You're trying to hit them where they live. You know, and this is getting, but that, that's the future. So this is where it can, it can go. Even if you run into things that won't run on it, um, I have my desktop running right here, VNC, on my iPod Touch right now, and I can control something on my desktop, I can close windows, I could open something else, if Flash doesn't work directly on here, I can run it on my desktop and watch it right here if I want to. And there's a lot you can do with machines. A lot of that we, I don't like to recommend too much because, I, because of security loopholes that you do open up when you turn on VNC. Yeah. But you can, yeah, you can do a lot with this. I mean, I, I run my home stereo with it as a smart remote. Um, the technology in these devices is actually really phenomenal. Hopefully, um, as coverage gets better, we might see more and more adoption of iPhones in the area. Uh, the, price, the price cut certainly hasn't hurt any. And a lot of the freshmen who did buy laptops got iPod Touches for free. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, that's the other question about requiring them is that's another 300, 300 to $400 device. We required iPods, but they, it was all, they, everybody had them. I mean, they, about, yeah. But, had but touches. Touches are different. Touches but, I mean, it's only now, now, but yeah. in a two, three, two, three years, it'll be a whole right. different, whole different right. thing. 